Hey, I'm Tommy Chong. Welcome to High on Homegrown. Yes, yes, everybody, and welcome to High on Homegrown, the cannabis podcast from PersisGrowing.com. This week, we're talking about the early days of the flowering stage of the cannabis plant's life cycle. We'll discuss how to identify sex, what light cycle is best for the plant, what to feed the plant, what size pots to put it in, all that kind of thing, so you know exactly what to do during them early stages when the plant begins to flower, or just after you flip the plant to flower on 12-12. It's all pretty simple. It can be complex. And again, if you have any questions to anything that we cover in this episode or any other episode, just head over to percysgrowing.com, start a thread, ask a question, and we'll be more than happy to answer it. There's lots of people over at the community there we're always happy to help so if you have any questions at all just head over there and make a thread it's nice and easy but again we have chad westport join us for the grow guides here uh, it was great to have him on the show this week we had him on for the news for the interview on wednesday and for the grow guides and it was epic to speak to him and we massively appreciate him coming along and stepping into the show that was super cool i hope we can do it again sometime soon but for now we'll just move on with the episode and this is grow guides part eight the early days of the flowering stage of a cannabis plant I hope you enjoy it. I'll speak to you at the end. Right then, so this week's Grow Guide, everybody, we're talking about the the early days of flower, because we're going to try and put the flowering stage into two episodes so we can break down what it looks like in the early days and how to treat it and then what to do to finish it off nicely as it gets further on down the growth. So there is reasonably a lot, a lot to cover here, even though we're covering just a couple of weeks of the grow in the early stage of flower. We're going to try and cover uh, when you can, how you can tell if the flowering period starts in like autos and things like that, what the early female flowers look like, uh, what you should be feeding the plant during this process uh, in, in between these first few weeks of, of flowering after the flip, or if it's an auto, then you know when it started to flower itself. And identifying whether the plants are hermaphrodite or not, because you only really want female plants unless you're looking at breeding cannabis, and then you want to look for males. But it's important to be able to notice the male flowers as well, just in case it is a hermaphrodite. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's about it, really. There's, I mean, there's plenty we're going to cover here. And it might, we get, we're going to do defoliation as well, talking about lollipopping and when to defoliate the plant for the best results, things like that, just so you get a, a nice idea of what's going on for the first few weeks of flowering. So. The veg we covered last week, and you've come to the end of veg, and you, you've decided if you've grown a photo period plant to flick the plant onto 12-12. What happens next? Monkey, do you want to talk about that? Well, that's when some people call that start of flowering. Personally, that's not my, my uh, definition of, of start of flowering, but what's going to happen when you first make that switch to 12-12 is the plant's going to change its hormone cycle and it's going to go ahead and, and stop growing vegetatively and you should, you should start seeing what's called some stretch. Mm -hmm. at, at that point, the, uh, the plant's going to probably at least double in size on most strains. I've seen some strains go up three, four, five times the, the height in a stretch. Depends how you handle it like that, though. But after you flip that, that switch to 12-12, the plant is going to change how it grows and switch from producing just leaves and, and vegetation to producing flowers in an attempt to make seed. Mm -hmm. But this stretch period is also known as uh, regenerative, regenerative growth. I can't really say that word very well. Regenerative, like that. I have to break it down. <laughs> but it's a difficult word to say. Can somebody say regenerative for me? You just did. Was that okay? Does it not sound dodgy? Regenerative. You see, it's, it's not easy. It's <laughs> not an easy one, man. What are you thinking about <laughs> saying it? Yeah, yeah, regenerative. It's like, yeah. It's no, but it's not regenerative. Regenerative is easy. Regenerative is what it there is. There you right? go. You see, you said yeah. it just fine. But I have to you say it slow and break it down. Otherwise, it don't. Regenerative. Yeah, you see. Just, you have to sound like Johnny Five. <laughs> Sorry, Regenerative. Much. No, you just have to put your glasses on and say it slowly. I don't know. Adjust okay. your pocket. Regenerate. Put the vape down for a minute. Do it. <laughs> random, <laughs> random tangent there. Yeah, <laughs> it happens. But and it's when the plant is getting twelve, twelve, like twelve hours of light and twelve hours of darkness every day, it will start to produce a hormone within itself. And after that hormone builds up to a certain level in the plant, that's when the the flowers will start to grow, whether it'll be male or female. They say that male flowers 
will grow a little bit sooner than female flowers start to grow. So you'll notice males earlier by maybe a day or two. But they're around the same time. It's just uh, after about 10 days, you say 10 to 14 days, you should start, definitely see flowers at this point after uh, 10 to 14 days of 12-12 yes. lights. You should see something in the form of, of at least pre-flowers, heavy pistols, something should mm-hmm. be showing mm-hmm. at that point. Do you want to uh, go through that next step there, Chad? How would you identify the sex of the plant? What do female flowers look like compared to male flowers? Well, yeah, you definitely, you want to be looking at kind of the crux of the plant where the branches go out from the main meristem. Uh, In those little crutches, you will see what we're talking about as pre-flowers, and some may be male, some may be female. Um, As all of us like to do, we're, you know, We want to know right away. So when you start to see a little something growing there, a lot of times I will get my camera or my camera phone, just take a picture and then blow it up to kind of help me easily identify it. Um, The the main identifying things, and this again is kind of pre-flowers, it's not the fully mature version of what you're going to see as far as a sexual trait, whether male or female. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking at it and it's female and you've got your picture blown up, Uh, A lot of times you'll see kind of almost like a teardrop that's attached to the stalk and a couple little just white hairs coming out, like the faintest little pieces of thread. Those are the, the pistol is the uh, actual everything, all of the parts. And then the stigmas are what's coming out. Those are going to catch pollen later. Mm -hmm. But those, if I see the two little hairs coming up, and again, typically they will be white little hairs, that is what you want to see, and I'll see it's a female. Now, to identify the male, um, in the majority of cases, males will have a little stalk that come off of that crux, Mm -hmm. and then it will have the head. And to me, as an early identifier, if I see that little stalk and then the ball, it's not attached directly to that crux, that's when I suspect it's a male. I'm going to let it grow out for another maybe week just to confirm. Mm-hmm. But that's typically when I say, oh, you're, you're going to be a male. Yeah. And we've discussed it in the past because this is a series of what we've been running through so far. We've gone through step by step and we've discussed in the past feminized seeds. And if you have feminized seeds, it's not very likely that you're going to see these male flowers on them. And if you do see male flowers on a female plant or seeds like that are feminized, you have definitely got feminized seeds from a good seed bank. If you do see male and female parts on it at the same time, you you have to know how to identify both just in case, then you preferably want to get rid of the male because you don't want seeds in your plant. Well, or the hermy, if it's a hermy as well. Uh, So after the pre-flowers have grown and you've and the, the, normal flowers have started to grow. Do you want to explain what they look like too? Chad. Yeah. Uh, Yep. Yep. No worries. Again, the normal flowers that you will see, and they'll be coming from this particular area. They're the, they're the white hairs that you see coming off of the cannabis plant, uh, coming out of your buds, you know, typically by that point they're red, but they're, they're coming out and that's what you're going to see starting to form. Um, The longer it goes, the more of those you'll see. Now, males, again, they'll start to have a little ball at the end of that, and that will progress into little groups of balls. Uh, If they open up their bananas uh, just in the way that they look in the shape, and that's almost too late because by the time they open up, that means they're able to drop pollen. So when you identify whether the plant has the hairs or the little balls, um, yeah, that's a good time to take them out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. And and if you're not looking at making seeds, if you see any signs of a male plant, then it's best to take the plant out away from the rest of the females because you don't want it getting pollinated. And that can happen pretty easy, man, especially photo period plants. If the night cycle, if at at nighttime during the uh, flowering stage, you know, you've got 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness for your photo period plants. If that night cycle gets disturbed too many times, or even if there's a light in the grow tent, like a light from a dehumidifier, from an extension cable or something like that, that uh, interruption in the light cycle can cause the plant to hermaphrodite and it will start to grow male parts and pollinate itself and you'll have hermaphrodite seeds. So you have to be very careful at this stage when you come to the flowering stage to ensure that the dark period inside your tent or your grow room is completely dark and it doesn't get any 
light disturbances. There is a small amount of light it can have, like because plants in the wild will get moonlight, and so it can receive a little bit of light at night time. But it, just to be safe and you, just to make sure you're not going to get a hermit, it's best to just have 100% darkness in the grow tent so you, it doesn't hermaphrodite. Ruined a previous grow of mine. Mm -hmm. I fucking I left a sock open on the just on the, the exact spot where the, the light would have been yeah, streaming into the tent. It's happened to mine as well. I've, I've yeah. hermit crops with a light leak before. It's it's and it's well, it's, it's easy to uh, yeah it's easy to fuck up like that, especially in the early days when you don't know you know what you're doing with the night cycle. Best thing to always do is it, when you before you flip to flower, get in the grow space with your plants. Make sure all the lights are off and everything's closed, and you can see if any light leaks are coming into the tent from there. And especially if you stand in the tent in darkness for five minutes, you know, no disturbed light, your eyes will adjust to the darkness and you'll see every little piece of light coming into that tent then. And that's where you have an opportunity to cover it all up and make sure it's completely dark inside the grow tent before you go into the flowering period. Because you don't want them Hermes to come, man. And, you know, they will. It's not so bad with autos. Autos can handle the, any light sequence, really. It's very rare for them to Hermy because of an irregular light cycle. But just leave them on 18.6 and then the six hours darkness can be interrupted sometimes. I mean, don't do it just because you don't want to take the risk. But, you know, it's, it's a not a new mistake autos. either. Sorry? It's not a new mistake either. We all fuck it up. Yeah. He, he, he done it the other day, man. Well, he walked you, in and he left the mm, fucking, mm, he left the room light on all night and he left the flare tent open for the whole oops. night. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> I've done that before. Yeah. You know, that's you're saying, like, fucking how much weed did I smoke last night? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I've got, I have a, a cover over my tent as well, a cover over the front. So on the ah. odd occasion where I have left it open, like, you know, you water it, forget about it and go to bed and then you come back the next day and it's fucking like, oh shit, I left that open. But it's got, it's got cover. Yeah, yeah, just in case, man. To reduce light leaks, mm -hmm. it? you don't want light getting yeah. in there. So, yep. Yeah. And, and I just want to say, too, that, you know, I, I mentioned two of them, and then we were talking about hermaphroditic plants. Mm -hmm. So there can be a third where you do see the hairs, and then you might see the little balls. So, yeah, do you always stay vigilant, particularly when it comes to new seeds mm -hmm. uh, or something that you haven't run if it's not from clone? But, again, visual visual aids really help this. So I know over on Percy's grow room, uh, there's pictures of what I'm describing here as little hairs and as the kind of little heads or the mm -hmm. balls. So that's always important for somebody if they wanted a little more information yeah, yeah. on that. But yeah, just uh, just because you see a little hair start growing, make sure you stay uh, eyeballs on. That's right. And sometimes these, I mean, that's later in flower. But sometimes these male parts will grow inside the buds as well, and then you don't see them, and you're pretty fucked after that. Mm -hmm. But you know that happens later on. We'll discuss that in the next episode. So, and if people want a little help in identifying, they can always bring their pictures over to Percy, mm -hmm. drop them in mm -hmm. a thread, and we will help you. Let you know if male or female, give you our opinion. So we do it every week. Before you move into flower as well, in, in auto flowers growers would tend to plant them in their final pots but some don't they like to transplant them and before you flip to flower or when the plant's going into flower you should be transplanting the plant into its final part at least a week before you intend to flower it so that's something that you need to consider i mean i i like to plant mine into their final parts and mine's about a, a fucking six gallon about 25 to 30 liters in my parts because i'm growing in soil what do, what do you guys use for your, your flowering pots. What do you say, Monkey? Threes. I'm in cocoa and threes three work gallon. is great yeah, for yeah, three gallon yeah. pots. And I, I mean, I did the last grow in twos because of, it was an experimental thing and all, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I'm going back to threes. It's it's perfect. And Marge is there in the micro pots still, isn't it, Marge? Um, yeah, I'm still doing small pots for my micro grow because obviously they're they're micro. Mm -hmm. But even when we were doing our indoor, they we kept this, we just did it in the rock wall cubes in the larger ones still. So. Yeah. What was the biggest size of the rock wool cube you used? Uh, it's a great question. I'm trying to remember now because it was a few years ago. And then um, it was, was the water like in the DWC or something? Would the roots grow into some water or something? No, but we had reservoirs. Right. So they, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember how big the cubes were. A few That's inches so by a few inches. <laughs> I mean, they would be the standard ones you buy at any grow shop. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. What about you, GB? You're in cocoa as well. You use 15s for your flowering, did you say? Um, 15 and 20s. All right. Uh, depending on what 
what's um what's draining them on growing, but um I've grown everything from one liter pots up. Mm-hmm. In flower, you know? well, yeah, for micro grows and shit like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, for the micros, yeah. What about you, Chad? What do you use? Yeah, I, I find that pot size can help control a few things. Like it'll mm-hmm. dictate the size of your plants. Mm-hmm. The smaller that you go, the bigger you go, you get a bigger plant. Mm-hmm. But also how many can you fit in a particular tent or an area? Because mm-hmm. that makes a difference when you want a variety. Um, but traditionally, I've been going with three-gallon pots for flowering. This next run, though, I've just switched to a living soil. So I've gone to seven-gallon mm-hmm. pots because mm-hmm. the pot is the battery. Yeah. It doesn't get food. So if you give it a small battery, uh, it's not going to last. So that's why I've stepped it up to the seven gallons for this next run mm-hmm. nice i see i always confuse some three gallons is three gallons 15 liters or 20 liters uh four gallon uh, about four liters in a gallon and it roughly yeah mm-hmm. so right. uh, 12 liters will be often it'll be three gallons oh so it'll be, yeah 12 gallon 12 liter pots is what i always use normally 12 yeah. 12 and the three gallon and yeah, it's it's, it's, it's good gallon. as well when you're growing in cocoa Yes, you can use smaller pots because it, I don't know, it's more efficient with the air or something. I don't know. <laughs> but when you use soil, yeah. you use the bigger pots because you're going to need more nutrients in there. That's where the microbial life is going to live. So you want to make sure that they've got plenty of space for the roots to grow. Well, mm-hmm. Cocoa, you're replenishing it every night. Yeah, that's it. So cocoa, yeah. you can go up to like 12, 15 liters. is good for a decent sized flowering plant. But when you're using soil, you want to be using uh, like, Man, this gallon shit, five, six gallons, seven gallons is good too. No, about yeah, 25 liters. 25 litre, litre no. pot yeah, yeah, is, yeah. is good for a soil. Um, mm-hmm. For a living soil, I could nearly go to a 30, 30 mm-hmm. litre pot for yeah. a good um, living soil. More roots, yeah, no more roots, more shoots. Gallon buckets. Yeah. And then um, the, all of this should be done about a week before the flowers start to grow on the plant. So if you're going to flip it to flower, then tra- do the transplant into the final part wait for a week so the plant can just get get used to its new shoes you know grow a little bit and then you can flip its flower then and that'll be a lot less stress on the plant and it'll grow its roots the, into the, the bigger part but with autos that's a little bit uh, more difficult to tell so you know you usually get your auto started off and it'll be in its final part to start with in your big uh, 30 litre part for example or your 15 litre part if you're in cocoa then you'd start your auto off in that. But some people start theirs off, and I start my autos off in a smaller pot as well, in like a half litre pot, 400, 500 milliliter pot. And then when it's grown up, just for about a week or so, then I'll put it in the, the final pot and let it do its thing from there. But some yeah, just, Jimmy, sorry. Oh, no, no, I'm finished with your plan, mate. But that's, that's just uh, what some people find. Some people think that it, the root gets shot on the autos easier. So it's better to just put it in the final pot, and then there's no stress on it whatsoever, and it would just do its. Hmm. It's grow mm-hmm. without having its roots disturbed, which it might yeah. prefer. I've not well, had problems with that, but but I mm-hmm. can see I, either way, whatever works for you, go for it. Mm-hmm. I I found if you grow sometimes, as I often grow in a leader pot, I start them off in. Um, I normally do my autos. I always put start them in their final pot. Mm-hmm. But if you start them in a small pot, as soon as the roots kind of hit the wall, that's yeah, when yeah, it kind yeah. of it starts flowering. Mm-hmm. You know, so with autos, it can. It can be any time, depending on what pot you have them in. Well, it takes about at least three weeks. Three TG, weeks said his, uh, TG said, I think, his, his earliest is 25 days. Is the earliest he's seen from seed mm. where flower and start. So you know, just grows. get it up and running and get it into the final part if yeah. it's an auto. But if it's a photo period, transplant into the final part uh, at least a week before you flower it. Well, TG also starts out under 12-12. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? mm-hmm. So it gives it about three weeks for it to mature and then it starts developing its its flowers, he said, he reckons. So the transition after the flip and the plant starts to grow its flowers, you're going to have to change what food the plant is getting because as it's going through the veg cycle, like we said, it's going to need a lot more nitrogen than it is the PK because it's growing the leaves and the stems of the plant, which take a lot of nitrogen to build. But as the hormone builds up in the plant and it begins to flower, it needs less nitrogen because it doesn't build as many stems and and shoots and leaves as it has been and it starts to need more potassium and phosphorus to build the actual flowers and to give the plant more energy to build these flowers as well so you, at this point you if you're in cocoa or hydroponics then you will change the food to your bloom nutrients rather than your grow nutrients and if you're in living soil you just carry on as you work because it should just carry on doing its thing 
<laughs> you know, because the medium matters on what food you're going to give your plant. And Monkey, you want to go first on what food you give your plant during the early weeks of the flowering stage? Early weeks of flowering stage is basically all I'm doing is switching. Up. I'm using advanced nutrients. So hold on. So let, let me break it down a little more. Like you flipped, sure, you sure. flipped your lights to 1212. Yes. So, you know, today you flipped it. Do you change your fruit right. now or do you wait? No, flip the 12-12. The plant's still growing. It's producing a lot of stem. It'll produce some extra leaf for a while. And I want to leave that alone for a while. So personally, I still feed it grow newts mm -hmm. until I start seeing actual flowers. And I'm not just talking about the random pre-flowers at the nodes. Mm -hmm. I want to see actual pom-poms. I want, I want the plant to get its fro on. I want to see all those little white fro's on the tips. Mm -hmm. And at that point is when I'm going to go ahead and switch to my grow nutrients. And only at that your, point. Your bloom nutrients. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Get out of the grow newts, get into the bloom newts. And at that point, the plant will do much better for me at that. And Marge, you're in living soil, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I haven't really changed anything, which is kind of nice. I like it. Yeah, just All keep the work going, at the yeah. front end. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Oh. What about you, JB? What do you, what's, what's your, what do you do? It's 12 12. What do you do with the food when you change it? I literally I keep my A and B roughly the same. Um, mm -hmm. And the same with um, I, I do that for about two weeks and then I start adding in my PK. I add it in slowly every day mm -hmm. and every day I gradually build it up Yeah, for about, about two weeks and then I start gradually building it back down. Mm -hmm. What about you, Chad? What are you saying? What's your technique? Uh, I, I usually go with kind of like a transition phase, like a two week transition phase in between my typical grow feed and my flower feed. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually a little bit less nitrogen. I'm stepping up the P and the K a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, just to try to focus less on biomass and increase bud production. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also kind of cutting out unless the medium calls for it. Like cocoa is, you know, typically calcium, magnesium hungry. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'll also kind of start cutting out a little bit of the calcium just because, um, you know, I'm like cell wall growth is, is kind of done. I really want to focus everything on the flowering. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what I do for that two week period before switching over when it, when 12, 12 starts. So when do you add your PK? Your extra PK, do you do, do you use um, it? Yeah, I'll start then, and it's basically just a different uh, bottle that I'm using, where it's in a little bit of a higher percentage. Mm -hmm. Throughout vegetation, nitrogen is usually one of the higher elements in there, um, but in this transition, I'm I'm flipping the the ratio, and you know, good nutrients in there is all about balance, so I'm not just dumping in a bunch of P and K and forgetting everything else. Mm -hmm. um, I want to kind of slowly transition it to where it's going to ultimately accept more P and K in the soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I used to, well, I've done both. And nowadays I really just, I, like Marjorie, just keep watering it during the early stage of flowering. But I do add, I do an Epsom salt spray over the plant as it gets, I mean, like, Maybe just as I flip it when it gets to 12 12, because I know in a couple of weeks it's going to be looking at getting a magnesium deficiency, especially yeah, in right cocoa. So, right uh, at flip, it'd be perfect time for that. Yeah, yeah. So, spraying yeah. it with some Epsom salt and Epsom salt, mix, spray the whole plant, uh, you know, top of the leaves, bottom of the leaves, covering some magnesium sulfate, Epsom salts. You only need like a teaspoon for every gallon, give it a good stir, and then a fine mist spray over the plant, and that will help it combat any magnesium and calcium deficiency that comes up. Uh, I, I still do give CalMag through the medium as well. It's just, I find that that just helps keep everything flowing. And I'll put my, when, like Monkey does, the same thing really. I'll keep my A and B running until I see good signs of flower, not just little bits, but when you see they're actually starting to grow. And at that point, I'll start adding uh, some extra PK and just reduce the A and B just a little bit. And things seem to go well then for a, a few weeks. It's pretty much the same way as I do. Yeah, yeah pretty much the same, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm excited for doing this living only soil because again on this flip I you know like Marge is I'm not going to do anything mm -hmm. I'm just going to keep watering uh -huh. and so that's awesome yeah man the plant knows what it wants and as long as it's in the medium it will take it yeah I'm I'm running this um, organic cocoa run now at the minute and I'm I'm a week into it now and I have to say she she is fucking thriving mm, you're only a week in bro <laughs> I, I know it is only a week in to be fair but and the, but the two girls that are on the the salts next were are 
easily, easily a quarter the size bigger, if not a mm-hmm. bit more. Yeah, no, it's, you, it's definitely you can really see the yeah. difference. I mean, I, I've done the cocoa thing for you know, cocoa was my medium until like a year ago mm. when I changed the soil, and I still haven't achieved the same yield. So I'm missing 25% off each yield compared to my, my yeah. cocoa grows. And the flavor isn't much different doing it organic either. You know, and I want to go back to cocoa, I think, but it just takes it, more time. When when you're restricted to size like we are because mm-hmm. of fucking the, the way the legal system is for us. It, cocoa, I think, is the only way that you can really keep a substantial yield in small tents. Yeah. When you have the options to go, when you when you have legalization, like you look at the likes of TG, he can have twenty five plants, you know, five Ooh. tents. You know, you can have the, you can run the living soil that way because you can fucking have plenty of them going. Mm-hmm. You know, and the yields don't really make as much of a difference to you. Well, as we're talking about yield, there's things you can do here at the start of the flowering stage that will improve the yield at the end of the grow. Now, this can be, you know, uh, low stress training, which you should have been doing some of that in veg. You should have topped the plant during the vegetative stage as well, maybe trained it into your uh, screen of green. If you are growing in a scrub at this point, you're going to continue for you know, flip to 12-12 and you're going to continue to train your plant into the screen for another two weeks until the flowers actually start to show and they will fill out the rest of the screen. Don't just stop training straight away. Because the, the stretch is when the plant is going to like double or maybe even triple in growth, depending on, on the conditions. And something you want to try to try and reduce the stretch as well. Make sure you've got good fans blowing at the plant so it has to build good sturdy stems. But watch the temperatures as well. The temperature between the night and the day needs to be around 5 degrees Celsius. So, or Fahrenheit is well, that's about 15, about, 12, about 15. 10, about 10, right. 10 degrees Fahrenheit, you know. You know, just to try and keep the day and night temperatures as close as possible, and that will reduce the stretch a little. If it's really cold at night and warm during the day when the lights are on, then the plant's going to stretch more, and you don't want that to happen. So, just keep an eye on the temperatures during, especially at that, that stretch phase, and try and keep uh, the plants short as possible because they will stretch a lot if you just let them do their thing. And if you trim too soon as well, because this, as I said, this was called regenerative growth. Yes. That was good, right? That was perfect. Fuck yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, you did it right. Right. Yeah. He would be proud of you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But you, uh, you, when you do, there's a thing called lollipopping, which is defoliation. You're going to take off the bottom third of the plant, keep the top two thirds. So all the leaves, uh, stems, uh, buds, you know, just little bud sites, they were all going to come off at the bottom section of the plant because you want the top section to get the most light and put all the energy into making the good shit. So this is something that you are, the lollipop and defoliation is an important stage, in my opinion. But if you do that too soon, if you do that before the flowers are actually showing, then the plant is going to go through more regenerative growth because you've taken a shitload off it. So it's going to think, oh shit, I need to grow more stuff to to recover from that loss yeah. and then it will stretch mm-hmm. more and you don't want it to do that so you have to wait until that right time when the veg is fully over and flowering flowering has actually begun you see the flowers starting to grow then you can defoliate and do your lollipopping monkey lollipopping is a thing that you do do you want to quickly explain what lollipopping is yeah i would first say that lollipopping is probably the most stressful thing a new grower is ever going to do because mm-hmm. what we're yep. going to tell you to do mm-hmm. is remove the lower half of your gorgeous kill plant. It. You just kill it. Yeah, <laughs> you just waited and took all this time to loving, lovingly grow all of this. And we, want, we need you to remove the stuff that's not going to get, get a, enough light, enough nutrients, basically turn into inferior bud. So in lollipopping, <laughs> once your stretch is completely done, uh, everybody has a different point is what I find. But uh, if you take your plant and you look at it from the side, start from the soil and come up usually somewhere about 50% up from the top of the plant and as much as maybe 60%, 65% up from the bottom, depending upon the strain and how she's going to run and what size your tent is, everything below that point needs to be removed. All your fan leaves come off, all your, your, uh, your bud sites, all your, your small branches that still haven't reached the top of the canopy yet and probably never will. Mm-hmm. And what you're doing is you're taking all that, all that, uh, vegetative matter and all those buds that are going to suck the energy out and you're going to push all of that energy down up to the top of the plant that's where your dense buds are going to get uh, formed that's where you, you know, the buds are going to be greasier and, and just 
higher quality stuff's going to be up there in the top. But if you think topping a plant is stressful, the first time you lollipop, you will second guess yourself. Yeah. And it's terrifying. Man. And afterwards, it's like when you look at the plant and you look how much you've taken off and you're going to be yes. like, damn, what have I done? But yeah, they, they, the they fucking love it, man. Yeah. And but what about a week later, you look at it and it's amazing what happened. The mm -hmm. plant has completely mm -hmm. recovered and it's starting to put all new bud sites out. You can see actually see a structure. There's but, a video uh, on Percy's YouTube. If you go to the Percy's Grow Room YouTube channel and search for, or if you just search YouTube in general for Jack Herra Grow Diary, you'll see mm -hmm. the Grow Diary and the montage that I did. And you'll see it'll go into the scrog and underneath you'll see all of the leaves and stems and stuff underneath the scrog. And then there's another clip of the video where I show it yeah, afterwards and you'll see how much shit gets removed. But you also see that the plant will be much better off without that shit wasting its energy. It's a good video to uh, demonstrate what lollipopping is. But it's, right. and it's, it's, it took me, I don't know what first time I did it, you know, I read all the things and I learned how I was going to do it like that. The first time I didn't do enough, which is very mm -hmm, common. Mm -hmm. Everybody tries it. And I think it was like three or four or five times before I finally find my comfort zone into where, where I know what I want out of a lollipop. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a little bit different. What do you do, Marge? So, you do some lollipop in. Uh, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't done it with this micro girl. I, and I did it a little bit with the outdoor. We used to do it a lot when we did the the hydroponics but mm -hmm. a lot of the times with my outdoor i just kind of let it let it do its thing i don't really worry about it too much maybe i should i might get better yield or something outdoor but... it's not so much of a problem because yeah. you've got the sun and the sun is like a nuclear furnace that plants fucking love but when you're growing yeah. indoors and an extra foot of space in between you know distance from the light an extra foot makes up a lot of difference and the the, the shit underneath that is going to be like four times less light than a, a foot above it and it's just not enough light to make it grow strong enough and powerful enough so if you yeah, just get rid of that shit if i should have done it with this current micro grow like mm. would you recommend doing that not on the micro grow i mean take off a no. little but not too much a micro when you've got these big bushy ass motherfucking plants you know six weeks veg on it <laughs> and then you flip right. it and it's stretched and it, you know they're big ass plants at this point then there's a lot that you can get rid of that will make it beneficial to the plant I've, if I'm in that doors. position now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got I, one I actually, plant that's three three foot long, and it's two it's two foot wide. So and yeah. it's just a beast. So mm. lots to come off, man. Oh, there's shit tons, and I've been waiting. It's I'm just coming into week three of flower. The, all the flowers are all nicely formed, and I'm going to be doing the lollipop now this week. What about you, Chad? Do you do some lollipopping? I do. Yeah, definitely. And lollipopping, I'll typically do maybe a couple of times. Mm. Um, once I'll do it, maybe about two weeks before I flip it into flower, mm. just to give it a little recovery, yeah. but to also focus the direction. At that time, it's a great time to take clones because again, mm -hmm. like you said, it's one of the hardest things to do. You're like, but a bud's going to grow from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's going to be but a shit one. Do you really want to yeah. trim it after? Yep. You know, you don't. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's totally my point when it comes to um, lollipopping. Uh, usually 12 to 18 inches into the canopy is where I kind of draw the line. Mm. And if I trained it as a really short plant earlier, um, I may not clean it up much unless I have concerns with air flows. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you have a really tall plant and you don't go, you know, at least 18 inches, up, 24 inches up, all those little buds, you're going to curse. That's the only time I ever curse cannabis mm -hmm. is when I, <laughs> when I had to trim those. So oh, don't spoil it. Better, they don't know that you have to trim yet. That's later on in the season. <laughs> oh, yeah, so. But yeah. And, and, and you know, uh, point two is, you know, again, when you're doing it in flower, um, you can do it then, or whether you're doing it early in veg or whether you do it twice, any of those times is a great time to practice your cloning technique mm, because mm. these are going in the trash anyways. Very good so point, man. if you're not comfortable with cloning, try it when you do these steps. Mm. My problem though, Chad, is if the clone takes, I can't bring myself to throw it away. Yeah, that is a fucking big problem, isn't it? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, suffered you're like that fuck, too. all yeah. 10 of them took. What the fuck do and I do like, now? My God, I can't throw it. I, I made life. You know, you got to do a ceremony when you throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, yeah. so true defoliation is an important factor man it, 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 especially when you're growing indoors indoors is important and as you said there chad with the airflow as well which is an important point as the plant gets bigger and bushier the 
and you get fat buds on there, then airflow becomes something that is very important. You need to make sure that air can flow around the tent fully to make sure that no stale air builds up and multiples germinate and grows on your buds. That's not what you want. So definitely do consider that with defoliation as well. But of course, everything to do with defoliation or heading into flower, all the help is over at percysgrowing.com. And if anybody needs any help with any of this, then you know just to head over there and ask questions and we'll yeah. help you out. One thing that helped me with the, with the lollipop and, and trying to figure out what to do on it was when I started learning to, to, to look at the plant from the top like, like I was the light. Mm. And when I looked down on it, I wanted to see the pattern, where the buds are, how much space I'm going to have between everything. And you can really see which ones aren't going to actually turn into anything. So you know, that, that kind of helped me get a handle on what I was doing. And you know, after I did it a few times now, like everybody else, it's, it's more instinct than anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's it, man. It's, that's the early stages. I mean, is there anything you think that we're missing? Anybody? You think we're missing anything here for the early stages of growth in these flowering cycles? I think that's it, right? Cover just about everything, and we'll cover more about the flowering, you know, actually growing the flowers and how to make nice, mature buds. Uh, I think that's what we'll cover next week, how to fatten them out and get the best out of them. So we have some questions from the listeners, as we do. We do the listener Q&A when we get to this stage and we have a question here from sparky what are the advantages slash disadvantages to scrogging and what is needed uh, in brackets net for tent versus wood pvc frame or closet etc with scrogging i mean scrogging is just a it's a good way to grow indoors and get the flat canopy to make sure that the light and the plant have an equal amount of distance between them the further away the plant is, or even sections of the plant is from the light, it suffers from the inverse square law. So it goes up in orders of magnitude the further it gets away from the top of the plant. So the, at the top of your plant is really close to the light, and the bottom of the plant can be a couple of feet further away from the light than the top. So there's a massive amount of difference in how much light the plant is actually getting. So if you use a screen of green, that's what SCRUG stands for, screen of green, is you'll put a flat grid over the top of your plant and you'll train the stems and the branches into that to try and keep the plant flat at the top. And then the whole lot of the plant is about two feet away from the light, rather than one bit being two feet away and another bit being four feet away. So it's just a better way to have, and it's a more efficient way to have more light cover the plant properly. And it's, it's a great way to grow, man. I love doing it. It just takes a little bit longer. It takes more patience. It definitely takes more work because you have to be in there training the plant pretty much every day for three or four weeks of the growth of the growth cycle but it's worth it man because it's just, i mean I, I love growing like that it's good shit but it does take extra work and there's loads of different ways you can do it i with mine i have uh um, two metal frames which are clipped together with cable ties that have 3.5 inch no uh, i think it's 3.5 inch uh, squares and it's just a grid a 1.2 meter grid of just loads of squares so, and it, you can use fencing for it you can build your own but I just use a metal grid and then I hang some some ratchet straps over the top of the tent and I support it from the top rather than underneath because then I can adjust the height nice and easily if I, if I need to. But just anything, uh, get the size of your grow tent, like a 60 centimeter tent, if you have a 60 centimeter tent, a meter tent, if you have a meter tent, 1.2 by 1.2, whatever it is, just get that with 3.5 centimeter squares across the whole thing, a big grid, and put it above the plant. And then you just slowly... Uh, keep the plant underneath it pretty much you just every time a, a stem goes through the screen you put it back down stretch it back out to the next square and that way the plant just gets an even amount of light over the whole lot of it and it's, it's just very efficient you'll have more bud sites the bud sites will be getting more light so they'll grow faster and fatter it's, it's just a beautiful way to grow does anybody else scrub chad do you scrub um I have in the past mm. when I had really tall plants that I needed to kind of manage the height mm. or if they had really weak limbs. Right. Um, so now it's a little bit more pre-training to avoid that. But some, some cultivars, you just can't escape that mm -hmm. and they need a little extra <laughs> love and support. Yeah. Were you saying, GB? Um, I've, I've scrogged in the past with a net going across the tent, um, but I have... The plant yeah, I, I don't like those nets. Yeah, yeah, the the nets they're usually not big enough. No, no. Well, the the squares themselves the holes are too, are too big. big. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. holes are too big, and it's not sturdy yeah, enough. 
No. That, that plant's strong, man, and it will push them <clears throat> fucking strings out of the way. Like, right. Move out of the way, bitch. It, it needs good, sturdy screen to get a good scrog on. Mine, mine now has a near flat canopy, and that was all just done by training. Just yeah, by, yeah, by yeah. bending the branches down a bit and just having a small bit of um, garden wire going, hooking into the pot and up mm-hmm. and around it and just holding it into place for a couple of days and then moving it on to the next bit mm-hmm. and moving it on to the next bit and it kind of just kept them all nice and flat and straight. Mission. Oh, it was a mission, <laughs> man. It was a fucking serious mission. Yeah. But it, 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 it has really paid off. Mm-hmm. It does, man. To keep that little yeah. canopy, whether you do it with a scrog or whether you do it with training, it does pay off. I think mm-hmm. the scrog is less work, though, because you don't have to constantly... Tri- I mean, once it's set up, it's like soil versus hydro, isn't it? It's, once it's set up, you're good. But to get in, it actually set up is a pain in the ass with the scrog sometimes. And you have to be able to get to the back of the tent as well because you have to reach over to the other side of your scrog if you're in a 1.2 metre tent, you know? And leaning over that whole four foot to get to the plant at the back can be a little bit difficult. Sometimes you have yeah. to go underneath it, and that can be difficult. But. Yeah, and unless you've taken some kind of precautions, most cases, once you have a plant in a scrog, that's where it's going to stay. You can't move them. Mm-hmm. That's another thing, but, yeah. It's stuck there. So if you've got a house inspection, somebody need to come around because they need to check the electrics or something, you need to hide all your shit. You ain't doing that with scrogs. You, you have to kill the You're going to have to cut the plant out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, what size screen opening recommendation? 3.5 inch by 3.5 inch. That's how, that's my preferred uh, yeah, size. I, anyway. I use three by three when I've scrubbed. Mm-hmm. Again, look for that Jack Hera video up on YouTube. Uh, you'll see it's on the Percy Grow Room channel and that will show you the scrub. I mean, there's even a video on there, I think I made one ages ago on how to actually do the, the screen of green and it might be able to break it all down and explain it all to you there. So check that out if you haven't already. So here's another interesting question from Sparky again. Thanks for the question, Sparky. Uh, how should I be using my lights if I'm growing autos? Do you want to take that away, Chad? Do you want to talk about this? Um, well, I mean, it kind of depends on what he means by how he's using his lights, um, whether that's like a hanging height, uh, whether it's a dimmer or not. Mm-hmm. Um, for autos and, and typically even just in the veg stage, I have my light intensity lower than I would in my flowering period. So, uh, maybe it's hanging the light a little bit higher. Maybe it's keeping it closer and dimming it down if you have that option. Um, but yeah, I usually like to reserve the full strength or hundred percent path. Uh, power of my light if it's not going to under a different light um i like to reserve that for when it starts to flower mm. you sort of simulate summertime then when the sun's at its strongest right yeah yeah i just um and, and again i don't know if this one is bro science but mm-hmm. uh i i just i know that it takes less power to veg i'm also in um a situation where i like to keep them small and you could again kind of manipulate height too with the amount of light that you give them you can still keep them healthy with less light uh and not be as tall or vigorous so it's situational but hopefully that answers it for you and we'll, we'll keep your eye or our eyes in chat too if there was a follow-up to exactly what you meant mm-hmm. on how to how to use it maybe i mean some people would be using hid lights the old school metal halide and hps i mean there's still some growers out there who do use that shit and you'd have to change from the metal halide as you, after the veg stage. When you start to see flowers grow in the auto, make sure you change the HPS for the R inspection at that stage. But it's, you sh- everybody's using LEDs nowadays. And I just put mine on, uh, I think, like, like what you said there, uh, give them less light sort of during the veg stage. It's just because they're further away from the light rather than me dimming it or anything like that. It's just a... Uh, you know about a foot different and then i just let it grow into the space it wants to grow into and they seem to be pretty happy doing that auto is very easy man just turn the light on and, and water it you'll be fine it'll do its thing <laughs> maybe it means by light cycle maybe that because uh, then it has to be on 18.6 or it doesn't have to be you can put autos on 12 12 as well but it will grow flowers and grow completely fine under 18 hours of light and six hours of darkness or 20 hours of light and four hours of darkness and some strains will even grow on the full 24 hours of light but there is there are some growers who do have difficulty with doing the whole 24 hours but then the plant doesn't seem to veg sometimes so just be careful with that one 186 is best for autos in my opinion do you grow autos chad 
I've only grown them once. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I think it was a 20 and four mm -hmm. cycle that I had them on, but you're right. There is, there's a variety. And again, with a lot of growing, there's many right ways to mm -hmm. do them. That's and it. all three you mentioned are perfect answers. Mm -hmm. Just pick what's best for you, man. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Let's get this question. We have one from Stutty. What's up, Stutty? What would be the best size of pot to use if you're just wanting a plant for making seeds? Do people usually keep them in smaller pots like five or 10 meters? You do some seed making, don't you, Chad? I do. And uh, that's, it depends on how many you want. You know, two gallon, three gallon is fine. Uh, you know, if you're in cocoa, which many people are, uh, so we'll just use that or soilless mediums. Um, so two or three gallons is fine. But a lot of times if I'm just trying to play around or I want to test a cross for myself, I'll just kind of take a clone, let it get roots, and then I'll put it into a one gallon to flower. So it's going to be smaller. It's not going to produce thousands of seeds. It may produce a couple hundred, but for me to test something, that's all I need really. And it takes up less space. You can do more of them in a tent uh, if you are trying to test the crosses on multiple uh, parental lines. Easy. Nice. Good, good answer, man. He also has another follow-on question from that one. When he says, uh, when you see the pollen sacs appear on a male plant, roughly how many weeks will it be until it fires its load? It's going to be about, you'll see the flowers form, and then about seven days after that, they might start spitting out pollen. Yeah, usually usually uh, 10 to 14 days after I uh, flip the light cycle for the male is when the initial pollen will start dropping. Mm -hmm. uh, when you see the pods develop uh again it'll start out smaller you can give it maybe a week and yeah it's easy to identify as a pod versus the hairs um that's the time to get rid of them mm -hmm. if that pod has opened it's too late yeah. it's dropped pollen yeah. and then we'll get up on your on your female stigmas and they'll make seeds and it's something that most growers don't want you know if that's what you want they're fine then let it do its thing just let the male in there to grow its flowers and spit its pollen about the place but if you see them sacks and you don't want seeds, get it the fuck out of there, man. Quick time. Yeah. And if you want to get rid of the male, you just cover that because it's the flowering thing, which we missed out. If you want to get rid of the male without disturbing the pollen, put a bag over us, something. You know, put a bag over the whole plant, sell a tape it around the bottom of the pot, and then move the plant out. Even turn the fans off before you do it as well. And that will reduce any risk of the pollen spreading around the tent and getting onto the females. It's a nice way to get rid of them. But yeah, about two weeks then you'll see, because it also, they, the male flowers grow a little bit sooner than the female flowers as well, right? They'll come a couple of days sooner because of the... Um, yeah, I, I would say p p potentially. It's probably, again, um, like cultivar dependent. But mm -hmm. yeah, the ladies I want in there for at least 14 days uh, to start getting uh, the pom-poms, as was said earlier, the kind of the pom-poms of the hairs. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the male. So I usually put the male in a bit after the female. I let the female get a head start. Sweet, yeah. Hey man, hope that answers your questions there, Stuti. I think that's all the questions we have as well. So nice. Well, I hope everybody's enjoyed the show. And thanks for joining us, Chad. It's been fucking sweet, man. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Chad. Settled right Thank in. you, absolutely. It's like you absolutely do Absolutely, my pleasure. It's like you've done this before. <laughs> once or twice right <laughs> man no it was fun talking hanging out and talking about some news too some some things that are a little bit more topical than just the the generic strain talk so this is great and the education that you guys are offering and the manner in which you offer it fantastic i can't thank you guys enough because again just just start growing people mm -hmm. start growing mm -hmm. then go to the website if you have questions yeah There we go everybody i hope you enjoyed uh, again thank you very much to chad westport for coming to join us this week it's been epic to have him on the show but well, i hope the information in this episode was useful to you it is friday so we do have the session this evening if you are free come and join us over on youtube.com slash high and homegrown for our live episode or you can catch us on sunday as well and where we're live every friday and every sunday over on that youtube channel but yeah massive pleasure having you here massive pleasure having chad here it's always good to do the show and we hope you're enjoying the series so far. 
uh, we'll see you uh, either on one of the live shows over the weekend or on Monday for the Cannabis News. But for now, have a great weekend. Stay high and we'll speak to you very soon. Thanks for downloading. Goodbye. <laughs>